Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. December 24th, 2007 is a day the town of Carnation, Washington will never forget. At about 5 p.m., the Kings County Sheriff's Office received a call with a person screaming in the background, but then the line went dead. Deputies went to Judy and Wayne Anderson's home, but they couldn't get in due to a locked gate. Two days later, Judy's best friend, Linda, went to check in on her and instead she stumbled upon sheer horror and tragedy. Linda opened the door to the Anderson home and saw bodies on the ground. Deputies and detectives quickly arrived and found Judy and Wayne's son, Scott, his wife, Erica, and their three-year-old son, Nathan, and five-year-old daughter, Olivia, all dead. Later, detectives discovered Wayne and Judy's bodies in a shed. All six victims were shot to death. Wayne and Judy's surviving daughter, Michelle Anderson, and her boyfriend, Joseph McEnroe, showed up at the scene. Detectives immediately honed in on them as suspects, and they both confessed to killing the family. Michelle and Joseph massacred three generations of one family all in one evening. Michelle apparently harbored resentment for her brother's wife, and she said that she thought about killing her family in the days leading up to the shootings. They were each charged with six counts of aggravated murder. Joseph was convicted in 2015 and given six life sentences in prison after the jury could not come up with a decision on the death penalty. Michelle was convicted a year later and received the same sentence. Prosecutors opted not to try her for the death penalty. Let's take a look back at the case of a family who got killed in a brutal and calculated attack. December 24th, it's the night before Christmas. And while most people in the small town of Carnation, Washington are busy hanging their stockings with care, it's a very different scene at the rural home of beloved locals, Wayne and Judy Anderson. Shortly after 5 p.m., dispatchers at the Kane County Sheriff's Office receive this chilling call. Hello? A few seconds of what sounds like screaming. Hello? And then the phone goes dead. Deputies are sent to investigate the Andersons' 10-acre estate, but never make it past the lock gate at the end of their long driveway. Then, two days later, December 26th, thanks to a gut feeling from mail carrier and Judy Anderson's best friend, Linda Teeley, the true nature of the 911 call is revealed. Christmas Eve, Christmas comes and goes. After the holidays, we all get back to work. Right. Take me there. The last time I had seen Judy was on the 23rd and we had hugged because we knew that we weren't going to probably cross paths until the day after Christmas. On the 26th, I went to work, probably seven o'clock when I went into work, and Judy wasn't there yet, which wasn't real strange. But by 7.30, she should have been there. And by about quarter to eight, there's no doubt in my mind that there is something very, very wrong. Call it best friend's intuition or something else. But with little more than a hunch to go on, Linda leaves work and races to Judy's house. So uh, by now I'm crying. I mean, I know there is something wrong, drastically wrong with my friend. And soon it seems her worst fears are confirmed. The house was unlocked and Judy always kept her house locked. And so I opened the door a little bit and I yelled, Judy, it's Linda. And there's no response. And so I open the door farther and lean in and yell, Judy, it's Linda, we're worried about you. I look down and I can see a man is laying on the ground. 911, uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up, she works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman and she's my best friend. Terrified and in shock, Linda continues talking with dispatchers, trying to make sense of the horror. And this is your best friend? Well, you know, looking at the person, that's the woman that's dead out there, I'm not sure it's Judy. There's no light in that room. In fact, when investigators arrive around 9.30 that morning, they find that the adult bodies are actually those of Wayne and Judy's son, Scott, and daughter-in-law, Erica. The baby boy, their three-year-old son, Nathan, still clutching his mother's chest. Sadly, beneath Erica's body, apparently huddled for safety, they find a fourth victim, five-year-old daughter, Olivia. 
All four members of the family have been shot through the head. It is one of the most heinous crimes former county prosecutor James Conant has ever seen. There was very little sign of struggle. Uh, Scott Anderson had taken his boots off and they were lying at the, at the foot of the couch. And so it wasn't as if somebody had been ambushed when they walked in. And it's about to get even more unbelievable. I was called in the early morning hours the day after Christmas. The first call I received from the um, sergeant who was presiding over the crime scene that morning was that there were four dead bodies in a home. A short time later, just about the time I was uh, en route to the crime scene, we learned that there were actually six bodies. Hidden in a shed behind the house, officers find the bodies of Wayne and Judy Anderson. Like the others, they have been shot to death. Judy's best friend, Linda, gets the news while still on the scene. While we're in the, the squad car, the police radio comes on. And they used a, a something like, he said something like L6 or something like that. And the detective immediately moved to turn off the radio. And I said, they found more bodies, didn't they? And he says, yes. He says, this is the worst murder case I have ever been on. I just cried. Across town, Erica's mother, Pamela Mantle, is just getting the news. She last spoke with her daughter as she was leaving for the Andersons two days before. The thought of my daughter walking in there thinking she's, you know, going to her in-laws, everybody's having a great time. She was in a wonderful mood and it's just like so shocking. You can't, you can't digest it or get it through your head that these people, you're not gonna see them again because they were just here, you know? With six bodies and no suspects, investigators begin scouring for leads. Did the killer or killers know the family, or was this the work of a random spree killer who could be looking for their next victim? As it turned out, police would not have to look far for clues. Christmas Eve in the small town of Carnation, Washington, six members of the Anderson family are cut down by gunfire. Their bodies are found two days later on the morning of the 26th. Who could perpetrate such a violent and hateful act? As far as anyone knew, the Andersons had no enemies. She just was a good person. No one had anything bad to say about her. She just was one of those people that was always there for you. And by all accounts, the rest of the family was equally loved. Wayne, a self-made man, and well-respected member of the community. The Anderson son, Scott, a hard worker and ardent family man. Erica was my oldest child, and uh, she was a child that anybody would be proud to have as her. She was like the model kid. But within hours of the tragic and horrifying discovery, investigators are surprised by an unexpected arrival at the taped off crime scene. At about 11 o'clock in the morning, we received word that two people who claimed to live on the property uh, were out on the on the, near the gravel road and were asking to be let in. The two people in question, Wayne and Judy's surviving daughter, Michelle, along with her 29-year-old boyfriend, Joseph McEnroe. The cops soon learned the two were living rent-free in a mobile home on Michelle's parents' property, just a few hundred feet away from the main house. Linda, tell me about Joe. He and Michelle met online and they both had the same interests in, I guess it would be called the occult, I don't know, uh, but in, in the darker side of lives. According to friends, the Andersons happily welcomed Joe into their family, but soon the couple began isolating themselves, Michelle in particular. Erica wasn't a big fan of Michelle. Michelle was, you know, any little thing that happened was a slight against her. You know, you look at her crosswise and or, you know, oh, you're talking about me. Judy and I discussed Michelle more than anybody because Judy worried with the lifestyle that she was living. So why were Joe and Michelle only turning up now? And where were they on the night of the murders? Detectives quickly noticed that neither of them asked one single question about why police are there. Suspiciously, not the behavior of a family member stumbling on a six-person murder scene. Actual footage from the crime scene shows the encounter. Detectives split the two up, and what they learn leaves them totally stunned. It didn't take long uh, for two very seasoned homicide investigators to uh, 
uncover in their conversations with them that they were responsible for the homicides. That's right. Cops realized the horrific killings of three generations of Andersons were carried out by Joe and Michelle. And according to the killers themselves, in hundreds of pages of confessions to police, what really happened is almost too heinous for words. The clearest information that we received from her uh, in the course of her three or four hour conversation with, with the detectives was that she was, she was upset uh, with her brother Scott. It began on the afternoon of December 24th. Wayne and Judy were preparing a Christmas Eve dinner for Scott, Erica, and the grandkids, who were scheduled to arrive later in the day. Sometime after 4 p.m., Michelle and Joe enter Wayne and Judy's house, armed with a 357 revolver and a 9mm handgun. By both accounts, Michelle took a shot at her dad in the living room while, while Joe was keeping her mother occupied so that she wouldn't see it. And uh, it would appear that Michelle missed, and that's when Joseph McEnroe put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. After Wayne Anderson was killed and lied, was lying on the floor, they turned the guns on his wife, Judy, and she, by both accounts, she begged them not to do so. Three more shots, and Judy falls dead. Then, with both Wayne and Judy eliminated, Michelle and Joseph dragged their bodies to a shed out back. And they had to do that before Scott and Erica arrived at five o'clock, which they knew from speaking with Judy the day before. Lying in wait, cold, calculating. When Scott and Erica arrived with the two small children at their prearranged five o'clock time, they came into the living room, sat down. And that's when Michelle made her move, shooting her brother multiple times before he even knew what hit him. Then the murderous couple turned their sights on Erica. At some point while Michelle and Joe McEnroe are shooting Erica, whatever gun is being used is out of ammunition. And during that time that, that they realize they're out of ammunition, she reaches over the couch and, and grabs the, the landline, a cordless phone, and dials 911. The absolute terror. I mean, she jumped over the damn sofa with three bullets in her and grabbed the phone to call 911. Hello? By the time that the 911 operator responds. Joe McEnroe, by his own admission, takes the handset from her, takes the back off of the phone and removes the batteries and throws it against the wall. Hello? Hello? He then, with Erica pleading for her life, fires the two fatal rounds into her, including the one essentially between her eyes in execution style. Joe then turns the violence toward the children, fires one shot into young Olivia, then turns the gun on three-year-old Nathan, still clutching his mother's chest. Why on earth would Michelle want to murder her family? And how could she ever convince her then-boyfriend Joe to carry out the most excruciating part of this grisly plan, to gun down her niece and nephew? These two were dissatisfied with the fact that Wayne and Judy Anderson seemed to like her brother Scott more than they liked Michelle. And as petty as that may sound, that was the reason why Michelle Anderson told those detectives that she and her boyfriend went up and killed six people the day before Christmas. Prosecutors immediately charged the two with six counts of aggravated murder, one of the few charges in Washington state eligible for the death penalty. Seven and a half long years after the murders, Joseph finally stands trial. It takes a day and a half of deliberation for a jury to find him guilty on all counts. But it's sentencing. Joseph's defense paints him as a mentally ill man who was manipulated by the real mastermind, his girlfriend, Michelle. She had a lot of anger and a lot of hatred, and she thought that the best way to act on that would be to go off and kill people. I was really her attack dog when this stuff happened. I did because I thought I had to. And yeah, I know that's not a very good excuse, but. I'm not trying to excuse myself. I'm just trying to explain my actions. And explain his actions he did so in chilling detail. So I went and um, moved Judy Faust. I put a bag over her head because I couldn't look at her because of see the emptiness. Well, the, she should be. <laughs> it's a powerful moment. 
but family members and prosecution maintain it's all in act. Whatever. Could care less what he has to say. I am not impressed with him at all. Then, in one of the most emotional moments of the trial, McEnroe describes three-year-old Nathan's final moments alive. He had actually showed, held up the phone battery and showed it to me like he understood and accepted what was going on. He handed the batteries to that monster and, and he shot him. That's not a man, he's just a monster. The courtroom is electrified. Family members beside themselves with grief, but the jury split. Eight to four in favor of death. He was sentenced to life without parole. Should he have gotten the death penalty? Judy and I had talked about the death penalty, and we believed that God should do the judging, not us. And so I don't, I don't actually, to be honest, I would, I would prefer to be dead than in jail the rest of my life. Michelle's own trial will soon begin. But despite the outcome, for those who loved the Andersons, justice has become only a word. There's always this big hole. There's a big hole in my life, and you know, my Eric was my oldest child. We will never know what Olivia and Nathan could have become. Michelle and Joe McEnroe ruined our lives. This is just heartbreaking beyond words. It it's is. hard to know how they even summoned the strength to accept the reality of what's happened here, an entire family obliterated. The big question becomes, why did she do this? Can you give me some sort of an insight into what happened? Matt, one of the theories is possibly money, another maybe jealousy. In a jailhouse interview with the Seattle Times, Michelle says, she grew up being told she should have never been born. She goes on to say, quote, I told them to stop or I would snap and they knew what I meant. They just pushed me too far and I just don't know why they had to push me so hard. Staggering to hear that. She's almost putting blame back on oh, them yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know, of course, that her boyfriend was convicted, he was sentenced. Right. So what's the latest now on Michelle's case? Well, Michelle's trial will start in January, and they are not going to seek the death penalty in this case. However, it looks like her lawyers are gearing up for an insanity defense. Is that right? It looks like it. Well, it is such a sad story. Thank you, Andrea.